Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation, along with a very Christmassy... <laughs> Woo-hoo! We didn't get your name, CJ. CJ Lou for the Fired Up with CJ show. And I'm all Christmased out if, if people on the video... Wearing red green, and green sweater, red scarf. It yes. looks good. Yes. I'm getting in the holiday spirit. I like it. If you've ever wanted, I thought about one of the tacky jackets after a guest last week. I didn't do it. Um, if you've ever wanted to start something but were afraid of messing up, then do we have the kick your perfectionism to the curb and step forward show for you. Today we'll talk about jumping past perfectionism, what it looks like, how to do it, and why you want to flex your screw-up muscles, and why you want to start doing it today. <laughs> that plus we'll talk about self-care and reflection, emotions as waves, process improvements, guest pitching, skating on a golf course, automating processes, finishing second, no pressure, where on earth the mousies are going, and what in the world drilling holes in your shoes has to do with anything. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, CJ. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to shine. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why you would be drilling holes in your shoes, and I can only imagine it has to do with putting skis. I don't, what what were you doing drilling holes in your shoes? So the the backstory is I am not the biggest artsy craftsy kind of guy. I okay. like it. But because, and this has to do with perfectionism, because I got scolded, yelled at, or effed by my teachers, literally effs, by my teachers so oh. many times. <laughs> and, and I'm sure I've shared the story at least a few times with you of, of the, uh, uh, the teacher who is a brother, uh, a brother, a Zavarian Catholic brother, like a monk, mm -hmm. um, in 10th grade who sent me to the headmaster's office um, because he said, you couldn't possibly be that bad at art. You must be doing this just to piss me off. Wow. What were you drawing? Uh, something that was, you know, stick figure-esque, I'm sure, and shaking and doing the best that I could. Aww. I still shake when I sign my signature on books. And um, wow. I am, I get nervous when I do arts and crafts stuff that I'm going to, quote, screw it up. My dad, he has the same thing. He has this most amazing hobby shop, you could call it, workroom in the basement where he's built model helicopters and he's built airplanes, these amazing, amazing things. He never flies them because if he frayed, if he does, he's going to ruin them. So I don't know how many generations back this fear of screwing things up goes in our family. But... Last week, we talked about uh, snowshoes, and I took a risk. I went for the snowshoes that you have to manually attach your shoe to them, okay. knowing that I may well get them and freeze up and never, ever do anything about it because I'm so afraid of screwing up the snowshoe or screwing up the shoe. Okay. I got them in last night. Um, there's a whole story having to do with skating and running hills and stuff, and we'll get to that. And I, I said, Saturday, you're going out on these snowshoes. We've been getting an inch or two a day, which has been piling up. Wow. It just keeps coming. This is this afternoon is the, I guess, the second afternoon we've had sun in eight days of snow, which is kind of cool. Wait, eight so, days of snow? Wow. So it's cloudy and snowing. Cloudy and snowing almost all of the time. I'm okay, okay. with that. This is right. not a complaint. So far... In the history of Michael, I've never said too much snow, mm -hmm. so um, I don't believe I don't believe we're going to be in any danger of that this winter. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I decided tomorrow I would go out snowshoeing, which meant I had to try to figure these things out. Now I could have bought the model that I got for Jessica, which has it's a little bit heavier and has the lace up system to it, mm -hmm. but um, where you slide your shoe in. But I'm told this is a little bit better, more high performance, blah blah blah. Wait, oh, so it's a, it's an existing. It's a, when I hear of a shoe. So there's like the ski, and then your shoe goes snowshoe. In... Snowshoe. So basically, oh, uh, snowshoe. Okay, got. It. So there's a snowshoe kind of base, and then you have Jessica has the lace ups that lace her whatever her foot is little, in there. 
little uh, zippy lace thing. You slide your foot in, you, you speed lace it tight, and it holds your foot on. Okay. In my case, you drill holes through the bottom of the shoe, wow. and you attach it to the snowshoe. makes it extra light and supposed to be a little bit less sloppy when you right. run. I, I said, that. Michael, you have a propensity for not doing these things. Now we're a thousand shows in. That's significant. Right. I've been saying at this point, I can find a way to do things. Right. That's strengthening your screw up muscle. Right. Why do I call it the screw up muscle? Well, because you have to risk screwing things up right. time and time again to actually grow more confident. That's part of the missing piece of the confidence formula is we think we have to get it right. And we'll grow more confident. But it's a chicken and the egg. If you have to get it right to grow more confident, then how are you going to ever try, in which case you may well get it wrong, to be able to get it right? Um, the, there's green screen throughout the whole time. There's We're green not, screen here and here. Do you, do you want me to stop you when that happens? Because it's happened nope. three times. And I'm looking at you going, should I stop him? Should I not? Nope, nope, nope. And I'm sorry if that drives you nuts. That's why I wasn't telling you to bother me. The little small ones we just can't worry about today. It's just that day. Okay. So right. only right. if so, the whole screen blows up. Okay. All right. So don't worry about the small ones. Okay. In fact, I'm I'm taking away your let me know privileges. Okay. I don't. I, I don't, don't have to. to I, I, I don't. I don't yeah, want you to more. sweat it out. Okay. So and go. Should I be telling them? Should I not be telling? Because I want. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Actually, I was kind of like, well, wait a second. Should I tell them or should I not? And then it interrupts my ability to listen because I'm not sure what to do. Bingo. That's why okay. I didn't want. So my apologies for not not striking that from you in the okay. beginning. It's okay. it's a lighting challenge this time okay. of the day. Okay. Till I okay. get blackout curtains. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. So you're talking about making mistakes and how you have to make a mistake in order to get the courage to move forward. Okay. That's where you were. Bingo. 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 So I got the shoes in. I got the snowshoes. I got the snowshoes in. I've got the running shoes in, and I got the drill bits in. And um, of which, uh, ironically, I didn't order the right size, but I went for it anyway. Shot well, how thick is the sole? The sole must be pretty thick for in order for it not to hit your foot, right? The sole on the running shoes I'm using is uh, less than maybe a centimeter thick. Okay, so, but then so you have little little screw little screws that are drilled into the shoe. Yeah, I'll show you. Okay. Arts and crafts. Here's the snowshoe oh, okay. with my running shoe attached. So you have three bolts through the bottom of it right. that go up into the shoe. I can't really show you in the shoe, right. but they have a little piece of plastic on the, on the shoe so that the screws don't pull through. So you drill the holes up through the screw, up through the shoe. You put in the template inside the shoe. You push the screws through, and then you bolt it down in the bottom. I see. So that's why... I see. So you're basically taking a pair of shoes that you're like, you could make a mistake. And, but are, are, and did you get like an old pair shoes. of shoes or did you Brand take a new pair of shoes? Wow. That um, is faith. <laughs> 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 so it looks like okay to me. Did it work? It looks okay. Well, we don't know yet. I get to go from here. I think I have another coaching session. After that, I get to go to the hardware store and get some Loctite because you need to get some thread lock on there to keep the bolts from unscrewing. And then tomorrow morning, I will go out to uh, either the Aspen ski areas or one of the other ski areas probably, and try chug lugging running up the hill on these things. Do you have to seal it so that the water can't get into your shoe? No, because you tend to stay on top of the snow, and out okay. here it's more like confetti rather than a real wet snow. Yeah, so it's uh, not going to so saturate into your socks and through the little screw holes. Got Bingo. It. I'll, I'll use wool socks. If it gets really, really wet, um, I'll get some, or really deep, I could get some gaiters. Yeah. A gaiter wraps around the bottom of your shoe, goes up your pant leg, and doesn't let snow go down inside of it. Huh. Uh, but that's only if we get a decent amount. Right now, even yesterday, which is, and it's compressed, so it was about six to eight inches of snow, I was running just with the running shoes without snowshoes, and my feet were fine. Wow. So it's snowshoe on it'll be even better but i did it yeah i've been flexing that muscle and even jessica if she looked at me she'd be dumbfounded that i did it it's been a process of challenging myself i don't know if i've shared with you before uh what i call the half a million or million dollar demo have i shared that with you before? no uh -uh. perfectionism so 
this is such a common occurrence. We all do this, particularly, I think, those who listen to the show, because we've got such big hearts. And, and the bigger your heart, the more you want to get things right. Mm -hmm. And so we all have that perfectionism tendency to us. Half a million dollar demo is a guy goes, he's a musician, and he makes the most beautiful piece of music. And so he records it to get it to a producer for a record label, see if they'll make this into an album for him. Finishes it, you know, it takes him a couple years, costs him a bunch of money to get it recorded. He goes, he takes his, his uh, well, we'll update it today. He takes his flash drive to the producer. And then on the way there, he goes, percussionist, I need some more drums in this. Mm. So he goes back, saves up some money, gets some money for a drummer, <laughs> records again, goes to take it to him. And then goes, vocalist, I need some backup vocalist waits a while, gets it recorded again, and so forth and so on, until he keeps on putting more time and more money and more time and more money. And then 20 years later, he still hasn't gotten it to a studio. Is this like a real story or is this like a, a Zen kind of pretend story? It, it probably happened time after time. I know with Jessica and myself getting books to publishers in the past or uh, relaunching a program or anything like this, we wanted to get it perfect first. Mm -hmm. And it would drag on and on and cost us more and more money and really give us tons of heartache. That's really how I used to be. Now I understand when I face that, my job is really to step forward. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is to recognize, <laughs> wait a second, this could be a half a million dollar demo. Because we all say, and, and you've had coaching clients come to you, I've had coaching clients, many, many come to me and say, I just want to get this right first, then I'll do this. Right. I just want to take care of this then. I want to get the training in this, then I'll start my own business. Right. Thens never come because they never end. Yeah. You know, it's, um, uh, I uh, used to, you know, as you know, I used to work at Microsoft and um, the product that I worked for was Microsoft Office. And when you have like Microsoft <laughs> Office and Windows, which are these behemoth products, they're installed in almost every corporation. So when you make a change to the product, you have to be very, very careful because, you know, it, like one mistake ripples across like literally the world, I'm, honestly. So, um, Launching products was always done in this meticulous, very rigid way. It would maybe take a year for, or two years to roll out a product because we would test it and vet it so thoroughly because the the repercussions were huge if we didn't. So that's where I, I started my career in, in Microsoft Office. And, and then I moved over to MSN and the Internet. And the time to market, if you didn't have a product on the market, um, you wouldn't get money, attention, like it was about getting something to the market as quickly as possible. So the way that web development works is that you basically launch a product, you get feedback, oh, that's broken, fix it the next day. You launch something, fix it. And, and now if you go into the software world, they have this idea. Have you ever heard of Agile? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a way of developing products and we both have talked to Bernie Roth who's in the Stanford Business School and he taught D school and he talks about kind of design processes and it's about um, launching the minimally viable product that you can launch without being you know without it falling apart <laughs> and then and then launching it and then refining from that point and uh, I remember and when we were launching the office 4 demo um, yeah. The, we were, I, I was a person who was responsible for writing out the demo script and like click this, then click that, then click this. And the product actually wasn't ready yet. So we had these fake demos that look like the real product. And if you clicked on one thing, the whole machine would go down. Like Or like it would, everything would fall apart and weird stuff would show up on the screen. It's just that's where the demos were. And so, and, and like when I was doing these presentations and people were, you know, each product manager would go out and do a presentation. There could be like 400 to 1,000 people in the audience. So you don't want to click on that wrong button because the whole thing could go under. And you kind of... I think the the virtue of that is that you start realizing like, you know, everything is kind of glued together, even at a gigantic company at Microsoft, because 
we didn't have the products ready at that point, but you have to start pre-selling in the products so far in that you have to, you know, you have to work with stuff that's super sensitive and, and it was truly a minimally viable product that we were, I was doing these demos on and it was terrifying. And you just have to remember, don't click that, don't click the right mouse button. Or it's <laughs> going to fall apart. Boom. <laughs> I love this though, and and it's it's a philosophy that I use now. I've never heard the term minimal viable project, project, product or project. I like this very much mm -hmm. because um, you get, in essence, you turn everyone into a team member. Yep. So, for instance, <laughs> I was just getting the getting the thought of you're exhausted. You need to get home. You go to a traffic light. You close your eyes at the traffic light. You don't have to worry about the light turning green. You just recruited the person behind you and the person behind them on your team to let you know when the light goes green. <laughs> They'll bonk the horn for sure. Of course, they're going to let you know. And so with a minimum viable product, you get it out there. That's what's most important, that quick turn. And then people can give you feedback. You'll over you'll over um you'll do everything you can to make them happy and more but you're getting that feedback from them yeah it's um I'll, I'll tell you how i used to do um so i've i i developed um a workshop for predictive index and this is a long time ago because they didn't have any workshops available so i had to develop it on my own and so i had to and it, i was new to the product so i didn't know the product and i didn't know I didn't know the depth of the product, so I had to get both know the depth of the product so that I can create an entirely new workshop. And it took probably 40 to 50 hours to develop this one piece of content, which I used and refined over and over and over again. But it took a long time to develop content. And I thought, wow, I don't know if I can kind of do this kind of development anymore. And so last summer, or this past summer, I started doing these online workshops via Zoom to these gals and I thought, well, I don't, I'm going to develop some stuff. And it started taking like five or six hours, eight hours to actually develop the content. And I thought, I just can't, um, uh, for what? later. What? Sorry. Sorry. I put that on the screen there. You're talking about developing content and I added one more thing for later for us. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, I was developing content and, um, and it just took so long, like it, it took four, 40 to 50 hours for the first piece of content that I developed, probably 10 to 15 hours for the next. And then I probably spent less than that, uh, probably maybe eight hours on the last thing I did on reinvention and this time. And so my goal has been like, how do I shave time to market so I don't have to spend as much time? So... Well, this time I went to, I have this group of women that I meet that I coach and I said, I don't really like, let's just, let me just kind of whip something up as long as you're okay. I'm going to, I have enough skills and enough tools that I'm going to just whip something up out of the air. And, um, I thought, well, I have this workshop that's, um, needs to be delivered on January 17th. So I have to start thinking about developing the content. So I basically walked in there. I had coached one woman to get a sense of what's my audience is small businesses to understand what small businesses, the kind of issues that they're thinking, kind of get in the mindset. So I coached just one woman, got into the mindset. So I spent an hour doing that. Then I spent like 20 minutes in my car as I drove over thinking about what I would present. I then presented the the material that just kind of came out of like organically out of my, you know, my 20 minutes of brainstorming. I got their feedback. And they said, okay. And I said, okay, so this is how I would do this for a personal uh, setting of life, of, of goals. How would we move this to business? I got a couple of ideas. They're great. And then actually took all that stuff, typed it up and put it into a, a content flow for a module that I'm going to develop. And it, I think probably I'm going to test it one more time and then get more feedback and then deliver it on January 17th. So that in total, maybe like four, four hours to develop something brand new versus eight or 20 or 40, 50, whatever. So, I mean, it's just about relying on others to give you feedback. So better to get feedback and move it out, move it out, move it out and just keep on getting feedback. So that's my, that's my, 
uh, thing. That's my challenge. So I know that you have your own challenge on how to get the show out quicker, like how to get more shows out with less effort. I'm doing that now with workshops. And, and, and we're going to be doing a, a, a coaching coaches certification program this springtime or mm -hmm. we're starting this winter. And what I've been telling people is we're going to build this together mm -hmm. on the fly. If we want a program this year and not in 2020 or beyond, we're going to do this as a team effort. I'm going to teach you. You're going to give me feedback on it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get you everything you need, but we're going to build it together, mm -hmm. which also there's a lot of ways that people taking your workshops will think of things that you never even thought of. So this approach can actually be more thorough than no matter how much you think about it and think you've got it perfect on your own because you're only one you. Right. So it's a, for example, this one gal, so I was trying to figure out, um, I was doing the Wheel of Life, which is a standard coaching exercise. And I can't, that doesn't really apply for small businesses who are trying to get business goals done. Yeah. And I thought, well, I like this idea as the starter and then she said, how about the Covey thing, the urgent, not urgent? I'm like, that's perfect. Let's use that. And that helped actually achieve the awesome. goal. And I, I was familiar with it, but I didn't make the connection. And she was able to, like, make the connection. And so just that one little statement and me going, yep, I know the tool, that saved. I think it came up with a better product. And I would not have had that thought had she not brought it up. So... There's another piece that fits in here, and I may have mentioned this story. This is feeling like a deja vu interview here, um, <laughs> which is Parkinson's Law. And, and Parkinson's Law means that you will take as much time as you have to get a job done. Mm -hmm. So whether the job takes two hours or 40 hours, if you have 40 hours, that's how much it's going to take. Mm -hmm. You will fill that time. So years ago, we made an amazing program. I'm very proud of it. Mindful Running. Mm -hmm. Mindfulrunning.org if people want to check it out. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed to take a month. And it extended it to two months, three months, four months. And it took us maybe a year and four months to get that program out. And really crushed Jessica even more than me because she was mm -hmm. the video editor for this whole thing. Mm -hmm. That was as her health was going downhill. We had put too much on her shoulders. Mm -hmm. When we made our automatic writing program, which will be coming back out for the beginning of the year, um, that program we're every bit as proud of, but we built that on the fly in a sense. We mm -hmm. built that fine-tuned it, added things, fine-tuned it, added more things, but because it was tight, we started that saying we have um, a, a long weekend before New Year's Eve or New Year's last year to build this thing. It actually in many ways came out almost better because of the tight constraints. There wasn't a giant amount of time, so there wasn't this vacuum that sucked up at all. Mm -hmm. So we all get to watch for Parkinson's Law, which says... I will start a new job when, I will look for a new job when, I will start this project when, I will start my new business when. All of those whens will just get filled into this vacuum and you may never take that step unless you have tight constraints. That bringing it back to the show is what Jessica as the producer has challenged me more and more and more as we go along. She's like, all right, it takes a day and a half to prepare for an interview. Can you do it in a day? All right, you're doing an interview in a day. Can you do it in half a day? All right, you're doing it in half a day. Can you do it in four hours? All right, you're doing it in four hours. Can you do it in three? Mm -hmm. And that tightening of the constraints, certainly my reading skills had to go up and up and up and up and up and up and up, but every skill had to. And, and it's the expression, and I, I know you're familiar with it because you do it better than almost anyone out there. If you want something done, give it to a busy person. Yeah. They have the tightest constraints and will find a way to dive right in and get it done. Yeah. And I, that's funny because I all, like, you know, I always say that. And I, and a lot of people give me stuff and it gets done <laughs> because of that. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I don't need any more. <laughs> but you know that they also, the, um, and also the opposite is true because, um, I've been trying to over my, my, I'm thinking about calendar 2019. Our show last week made me start thinking about that. And, um, and what I realized that part of what this year was about was, oh, was that a stop? No, that was me putting my hand over the screen, which all the fuzzy green snow. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. It appeared magically like Merlin the Magician. Sorry about I that. I feel... <laughs> Okay, um, so in in 2019, um, I was looking at. Okay, so 2019, I'm thinking about my goals, and um, every almost every year except last year, I put together. I uh, Jean Hayner, this uh, the person that I interviewed, she does Chinese face reading, and she has a pro, uh, this um, uh, kind of like a. I don't know, kind of like an astrological reading that's based on the Chinese nine star key, which is the belief is that we all have, you know, nine forms of energy and each year has an energy associated with it. So there's like the year of water and the year of wood, yin wood and yang wood and yin earth and yang earth and fire and metal. So those are the, and I'm missing one, firewood. Oh, and um, I talked about earth. So anyways, yeah. there are eight of them. Okay. Or nine. Okay. There are nine. Um, so this year for me is a mountain earth. So it's like mountain, like, and uh, last year was about letting go and which is very congruent with what, and she said that the, you start around November and December starting to feel the energies of the next year. Yeah. And so next year for me is going to be all about reflection and contemplation. You know, like it's the recapitulation where you let go of a bunch of stuff in the past and you're now trying to figure out what you would like to do in your future and uh and so I've I've been taking I've been taking long gaps of time to kind of do that and what I realize is if my time gets filled in with a whole bunch of I would say in the Covey quadrant it's like not urgent not important (laughs) so so giving it back so the corollary of give it to a busy person I now know why because when you have more time just things start expanding around it and procrastination happens and all these the lack of urgency and the stillness it's very hard to kind of keep the not urgent not important things to not fill up your whole life like all of a sudden I'm walking over to get coffee more often than I used to (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or looking on Facebook more often than I used to. I mean, and that's kind of, so it, I understand, give it to a busy person, get it. There's there's a certain amount of meandering that's important, particularly like getting the coffee. The the social media can can connect strings, but it can also be such a black hole. But But that time we think is being, quote, wasted, in quotes, by the busy person. You want me to go all the way over and get coffee, but I could just blah, blah, blah is actually of benefit. So the end of this year, we're going to do something that's real uncomfortable for me with the show, which is we're going to take six days and minus a few uploads to keep the show going. Of, um, We are not going to work. And last year when we tried doing this, we made our automatic writing program. Oh <laughs> so it be interesting to see what happens this time around. But I really, the whole concept, it, and, and it can be applied to your life as well, of being on our business versus in our business. Mm-hmm. On the business means you step back. You're almost like from a satellite point of view, looking down at what's going on. And you're able to play with it and tinker with it as if it's, you know, a little piece of Monopoly or something. In your business means you're chasing your tail so much and trying to play catch up or keep up that you have no opportunity to step back and look big picture at what's going on. Mm-hmm. And so Jessica and I are going to step back on on family, on future, on 2019 and 20, on our business, and, and really try to get a more holistic perspective. That may mean more metaphorical trips to get coffee or more, quote, wasted time doing something that seems kind of frivolous on the surface. But those times that we step back, as long as we don't try to make a schedule, what are we going to do over the six days? The more that we don't know that we're what we do and get lost in that, I think the more universe is always speaking to us, in fact, screaming at us. The more we do that, the more we give space for the universe to come in and give us an idea, give us give us a clue, give us a bone Mm -hmm. where to go next. Mm -hmm. Well, my next year. I guess that's going to be, it's the woman said in the reading, she said, it's think about the mountain and going into the cave and reflecting. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, I feel like that's what all this year was about. And this is all about next year too. And then I said to my husband, cause it's based on the year that you're born. Both of us were born in 1963. I'm like, Hey, um, 
hey, 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 Gideon, this year is all about actually um, reflecting and, um, you know, contemplating. It's like, isn't that what she says every year? <laughs> She doesn't because I was listening and crying. Like, I don't know. But she does say every year, like, you know, it's about reflecting. But it's but this one was a particular, like, it's about reflecting on family and reflecting on, you know, it's like your next stage when you hit middle age. So it's perfectly, it's literally perfectly time for where we are right now. But it was very funny. So I guess this next year is going to be about that. And, and you know what was so nice is that um, in the last coaching session that I did, that I did on the fly, I decided to do the exercises myself. And the one area that uh, was the area that I wanted to spend more time and energy this year was a, of self-care. Not like getting massages and stuff, but just like doing things, um, like just taking a couple of hours doing nothing, you know, or just doing frivolous fun things. Because I realized that I keep, I love it, having fun, and then I keep on squeezing it out of my schedule where I don't, I'm not having times where I'm just talking to a friend laughing or, you know, going and making ornaments or, you know, just something that's kind of fun. And so I'm trying to each week, my, when I met with this group, I said, well, my goal is to spend one or two hours every week, um, working on self-care because otherwise if it's not a priority, it's not, going to happen and the problem is there's so many other people asking for your time it's a very easy thing to squeeze out so so that's what my next year is going to look like and it sounds like six days yeah this is something i've worked with coaching clients a lot on recently is building that that structure that routine and and that space and i think we may have a whole show on it maybe next week's topic building that space that uh vessel in which we can play because if we say, well, I'm just going to take an hour or two for something, if you don't actually say I've got from two to four, then at 2.30, you're going, have I taken enough time? Have I at 2.35, have I taken enough time? Mm -hmm. Well, shouldn't I be getting back to work? Shouldn't I be getting back to work? And you start to get all nervous and anxious mm -hmm. because you haven't. It's sort of the same thing happens with meditation. I'll just meditate as long as I want, and then I'll begin my work. Work will start to encroach and, and to, unless you said... I have a whole bubble. This time is completely blocked off. Mm -hmm. And so we have to become religiously neurotic of setting that time or else the world will encroach on us from the yeah. inside out, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So Thursday is my day to actually do this. So that's, I did it sometime yesterday. Like I basically used, I thought, well, I'm just going to use this this time to get coached. So I had a guest, I looked at her exercises, which was what the book was about. We went, she coached me on those exercises and it was, it was a way to do both. So I was doing a radio show. I was helping out a guest and I was helping out myself at the same time. And she was fantastic. She had a whole bunch of things that I hadn't really thought about before. And if I hadn't used that time to be about me and her, you know, it's, it was a weird thing. It was like, thinking about how this could be as much for you as it is the other person. Cause usually when I'm doing a show, I'm thinking, Oh, this is for the other person. Um, and I think it's, how do you make it? And it's about me cause I'm asking the questions, but it's how can you, um, this, uh, I was reading a passage by my teacher and he said, you know, the more that you can, um, come from your center with everything that you do, so there's this kind of fullness and joy of expression. Every time you do something, the more, like, everything becomes a joyous event. And so really what I did was, though, oh, this is my time together. This is my time yeah. talking to this gal. And it just became, like, a really fun, fulfilling time. I mean, just like our conversations every week have become a fun, fulfilling time for me because we all, you know, I mean, we have, like, the two of us exchange ideas. It's an exchange idea and kind of share. It's like having a witness throughout your whole life, you know, that, that you know, from coast to coast sometimes. But it's, I think that there's, if you can have everything that you do, even quote unquote work, be an expression of that, it's kind of, that's, I think another goal would be so that it's not, so that everything is self-care. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. So, and, and 
Well, there's the term me search. I, I can remember just, just for fun. And then I want to dive into some of these things we've got on the list. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to handle the power yet. And in our first few months on the show, I had David Allen getting things done on oh. the show. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and I went into, let's pretend it's about uh, Inspire Nation and how we want to spruce up Inspire Nation. And I love you, David. The interview went well. We had to do some creative edits in it. <laughs> he politely, or not so politely, he said, if I was a business, can, your business consultant, and then he tore me apart. <laughs> wow. Shred by shred. Oh, my God. And I handled it with grace and poise and as much love as I could. And I said, mental note to self, until you're ready, maybe that's not the best way to approach your <laughs> interviews. <laughs> I bet people got a lot out of it, though. They're I'm like... sure they did. And and he at the time, this this was, you know, in the first handful of shows, Nurses Now, a thousand shows later, he old dogged me. <laughs> He'll dodge you now? Uh, old dogged me. He was he was the big old dog on the block. I was the little young pup, oh. and he put this young whippersnapper in his place. <laughs> Be interesting to see if you talk to him now what would happen. This, this is true. I'm not sure I'll be going there, but this would be very <laughs> true. And I do love him, and I love, love, love his work. But, okay, well, but since I, you're talking about... i a few wounds. <laughs> since you're talking about guest pitching, or guests, tell me about what you've been guest pitching on. So, so um, normally, um, we are so, quote, full that there hasn't been that much guest pitching in quite a while. They keep coming to us. Holiday season, things slow down a little bit. And so I've been reaching out mm -hmm. and I've been watching and observing my nervous system when it comes to reach out to guests. Mm -hmm. I'm like a thousand shows in on iTunes. You type self-help. We're number three right now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, even just saying it, I can hear my nervous system kick into a high gear. Mm -hmm. There's a part of me that's a Afraid of rejection or afraid of not writing the right letter. And I realized both how far I came when in the beginning, one out of 20, if I was lucky, guests say yeah, would say mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And now, 99 out of 100 days, we've got more than enough people writing to us. We don't even have to ask at all. Mm -hmm. And so I've been watching how it's transformed. And then also, since we're talking about perfectionism, how the letter transforms, how what I reach out transforms. So there's a process that we go through. The first few, like bolting my first snowshoe here, this one was really, really scary. Mm -hmm. The second one was a little better. It'll get a little easier and a little easier. And we start to automate our process and grow more comfortable in our skin. Yeah. So it's a matter of risking and putting yourself out there. Yeah. And in the case with guest pitches, I took a, a whole morning this morning and I said, you're just going to sit here. If you want to pitch this guest, you do. If you don't, you don't. But you've blocked off this time. You don't have to hurry. You don't have to rush. Mm. Just be, gently be with the experience. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you, I, I think that there have been a couple of guests that I pitch and like, I don't know if they're going to say yes. And if they don't, it's also like, who cares? Like it's. But now you say that. Yeah. Uh, how did you feel in your first show? So in my first shows, I said, who cares? And then there was the niggling fear. But, 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 but who's going to come on the show? The first guest right. I pitched, though. Right. Number you, one. Yeah. Because okay, I think, okay. yeah, it's hard because you have to do seven times as many guests as I do because I have only one a weekly show where you have a daily show. So that's really intimidating to like ramp up to that many people. And I just started asking friends and family that I thought were interesting and then they would bring me people and I just kept on asking them. And then after you get enough people and you get enough traction, like you have been doing, it starts being a lot easier. It's like uh, asking for what you're worth. That's one of the hardest things. So I just increased my rates from 200 to 250. Like my rates were just too low for a really long period of time because I was finding out there are coaches in the Bay Area that charge about the same amount that I charge and they're right out of coaching school. And I thought, oh my God, maybe I should charge even higher than that. But then I don't want to like lock out clients. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to charge $50 more because then at least I'm in line with some of these new people that are coming out. But yeah, and, and, and so at first it was like, oh, I'm charging, I just increased my rates to 250 
And at first it was like, well, you know, I'm just increasing my weights. And so, you know, and then it's like, guess what? I didn't get 250. And then now I'll just say, yeah, it's 250. Like, that's it. Done. You know, like we can't, there's not a conversation to have or wavering, but it took probably two people to say it before I got to the point where it's like, yeah, it's 250. Done. I, I, I love this. There were a bunch of different directions we, we, I, I wanted to go in this. And for, first off, anybody, if you have a guest you're interested, either go to our Facebook page, which is Inspire Nation, and let us know. And I've been going through that list and, and looking at people who people have been letting us know. Um, I think it's the third post down. We're asking, who do you want on the show? Or just email us at info at inspirenationshow.com. Let us know who you'd like on the show. It's your show. With that said, the higher you charge, the more value coaching clients get out of it. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, but it's true. If it's not valued highly enough, people won't put in that much effort. It's so true. Because so I was doing these free coaching sessions. I'm and, and you know what? I got the worst results with those free coaching sessions. And I was doing the same great work not as much gratitude. In fact, people are like, well, you know, now, you know, I'm like, well, that's because you didn't pay. And also because you didn't pay, you didn't do the work and you didn't there take you it seriously enough. And so I found when I charged a long, long time ago, I charged 75 and then I charged and the clients were just crappy and they were niggling. And then I was getting pissed off because I know that at that same time, I could have offered this guy the same consulting or go to a corporation and I'd had friends who had the same experience as me that was charging, they're charging like 350 an hour. And here I am charging this guy $75 an hour when my market rate for the services I was offering was 375. And I thought, this is just bullshit. <laughs> I'm not doing this anymore. So I'm like, after I'm like, I think you're done. So he was long and he was complaining about the price. I'm like, forget it. And then I doubled the price and my, my, the quality of the people that I got was just way higher. And then I got so many people, even when I doubled the price that it became too hard for me to be a working mom. So I, I increased the price again from 150 to 175 still was getting too many people so moved it from 175 to 200 where I was sitting in that rate for like I don't know like 10 years that's why I thought it's time to increase my rates and probably like 11 years I, st I stayed at that rate but the clients just kept on getting better and better and the results are commensurately better and better because they care and, and and that's where we're at which is going into and we're still going into babyhood this coming year and we're we're working on being able to do some more big picture things the time for coaching has gone down the rates get to go up and uh, it, it's a funny thing I've been joking about it with people who have been having um, free one-on-one -on -one sessions with me mm -hmm. at the moment which is the rates were supposed to go up before um, Jessica miscarried mm -hmm. and so we haven't had any big picture discussions on anything mm. and so the running joke is well if you want to get in right now here's the rate today as soon as Jessica actually gets back from Mexico and we can have a talk <laughs> right the rates are going up but there's a funny thing about rates that has to do with perfectionism and has to do with um, um, I want to say self-confidence but there's there's something even more to it getting comfortable in our own skin I'm thinking of a rock climber mm. going up the side of a, of a, of a mountain and you have these pinholes. You lock yourself into the pinhole. Uh, you, you, you put the, the, the pin into the rock, then you lock in with your carabiner, then you can go up to the next one, to the next one, and to the next one. Your value has to be reflected. Your internal value is reflected in your price, or your price is reflected in your internal value. So if you just say, I'm worth $500, mm -hmm. And you don't believe it. You haven't anchored it in. Right. Nobody will pay that $500. If you believe it, if you say, I've had, I've coached for X number of years, I've had these clients, I've had these trainings, I've had these guests on the show, whatever it is for you internally, and you go, by God, I should be charging $500 an hour. Right. I'm worth thousands. I'm worth what a Tony Robbins is worth, even right. though I'm not going to charge that yet. Then you're anchored in. And the funny thing is you will offer that same price, but with it internally anchored in, get a completely different result. I, and then that's so true. And it's funny because for three, uh, I had 
two years ago, I was charging 350 an hour for doing corporate stuff. And I had no qualms about that at all. Same person, no qualms at all, because that was kind of market or even less than market at 350 for corporate coaching. So it, it but it's the same person. I'm offering the same skills and, and abilities. It's just for personal coaching, it's kind of expensive, but well, whatever. You get what you pay for, honestly. So going back then, since I mentioned Tony Robbins, and I want to yes. go back real briefly to pitching, and then we'll, we'll see if we can hit a few of these things. Yeah. First, first guest I pitched on the show, I don't recall who it was. It was a, let me throw it out there and get it out of the way. Mm -hmm. The second guest I pitched was Tony Robbins. It was? And, wow. And we haven't had Tony on the show yet. I know he will come along when the time is right. He'll realize we're the greatest show on earth. And he'll say, Michael. Where have you been? Why aren't I there? <laughs> but to overcome my worry and concern of rejection, I threw the Hail Mary right away, knowing there's an extremely good chance a brand new show Tony's not going to say yes to. Another, another uh, example of this, and I don't know if this is a true story or not. This is what I heard from a bike shop owner. Person buys an incredibly expensive bike. Today, I guess that'd be, what, a twenty or $30,000 bicycle. Wow. They're, they're, they're the price. A $10,000 bike isn't even that crazy anymore, which is crazy. That is crazy. I know. So the guy buys a twenty or $30,000 bike, and he goes, can I borrow a pedal wrench? It's a big, long wrench that you, that you hork down a pedal on, real heavy wrench. And the shop owner goes, you don't need one. The pedals are tightened on. And he goes, oh, that's okay. Can I borrow the wrench? Owner goes, sure. Gives him the wrench. The guy goes and takes it to his beautiful, I don't know, unobtainium metal frame and goes, whack, and puts a dent right in the top two. And the shop owner goes, my God, man, what have you done? And he goes, now I don't have to worry about it and I can just ride it. Wow. Is that a true story or is this also? <laughs> I could not tell you. If it's beautiful bike lore, I like it because there's a point in there. Yeah, this, this whole get... wabi-sabi thing where like a girlfriend of mine stayed at her house and she had this huge stain that is on her dining room table. I'm like, well, we'll always remember you, Virginia, because there it is. Okay. It's part of life, right? Like it's part of life can't get too twisted about stuff like that I think it's hard though it's hard but I get it like when my wedding ring you know which has so much sentimental value um I had the one of the prawn um um prawns I guess is the one things that are holding on to the diamond had loosened and so I asked them to tighten it and they reconstructed the whole ring so I got it and it didn't look like it looked at all before and I was I was like literally in shock I thought, oh my God, I cannot I'm believe. if I can get this thing off. I have the humblest wedding rings of wedding rings. They, I, I got two because. Yeah, you one, got two? Well, one is me married to Jessica. Uh huh. And, and it's an ohm symbol. Oh, neat. Uh, with the ohm out. Okay, you know, got uh, it. Yeah. Built out. Yeah. And then I have one of me married to God or universe on the other hand, which is the ohm inner. So wow. they're inside out rings. Oh, that's cool. Representing the the love for Jessica and the love for universe. These I got at a Tibetan little store for like $20 each. They have literally dented. One is like dented and squished on my finger I here. Mine, I actually had to get, but, you know, you can go to stores. I had mine. They polish it. And they, yeah. they change the shape so that it's round again, and they polish the, the surface so they don't have dings in it, if you want. But the joy is also having all those little dings in it, too. And it's, it's the meaning behind it. Will I someday upgrade? It's a weird concept. Who knows? Um, but, but in that humbleness, there's something special about it. Yeah. You know, broken, broken prongs or moved around or anything. Now, mine is back to the way that it was because they were able to find, contact the original because I almost had a heart attack when I saw it because I was like, I love that ring. Why did you change it? But they were able to restore it back to its normal way. But before we go, what, so, so what, what have we not hit? Skating so, so on the golf course? So I got out last Friday um, or last... Whenever we spoke was the day I guess I got out and, yeah. and tried my first day skate skiing yeah. and um, was a challenging experience, was very, very um, 
high learning curve. That's okay. Right. I went, at, went back out the next time and I'm starting to figure this out. It's actually, it will at some point click and come really well. But right now, um, there are habits and quotes from speed skating that are the opposite of what oh. you want to do in skate. Oh, skating. that's interesting. And I didn't know that. So I have to translate them in my mind. So I was out last time not having much fun and looking up at the, the, the mountain, at the ski hill, and going, I just want to run up that. And I don't know if it's going to be a grass is greener on the other side, and I'll play on the mountain and want to be back on the skate skis, or if this is part of the, the letting go of perfectionism journey of you try a bunch of stuff, you don't worry about being good at it, and nobody's, relatively speaking, Michael Jordan actually what got kicked off of his high school basketball team. He wasn't that good at basketball. <laughs> So you just keep trying things and experimenting and exploring and and also be willing, like with skate skiing, be willing to not be good at it for a while mm -hmm. and say, I have a feeling I may really enjoy it. I've got to go through this learning curve rather than if Michael Jordan had thrown up the first few balls and they didn't go in and gone, well, I'm terrible at this. Let me find a different sport. But instead, you stick with it. If you've got that that passion in your heart, not excitement, they're, they're different. Excitement's kind of that flash in the pan. But if you feel a call, a pull toward it, then stick with it and let go of any need to be perfect or even adequate. Mm. In the I'll, I'll tell you two, two stories. There's the Aikido versus yoga. So when mm. I did yoga for the first month, the first couple of sessions were just irritating. I... I I was probably the opposite of most yoga students when I went in and I just felt irritated afterwards <laughs> because I didn't know what I was doing. You know, like, you know, you're turning and everyone's turning towards facing the mirror and you're the person facing the wall. <laughs> you know, like it's just one after another of like, what's that move? I'm falling down and all these different things. <clears throat> and it took probably a good three months until I, I actually got it and 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 gradually after the first week and after the second week I started feeling the benefits of yoga but it took a really long time about three months for me to stumble out of and in fact that is what yoga is all about is how you can remain centered while you're balancing on one leg and about to fall over and not you know beat yourself up over the whole idea of falling over mm -hmm. or not not even be able to lift your leg um, so it took me about three months, but then I got to the sweet spot in yoga and I'm like, I get it now. And I did the same thing with the keto and, um, I kept on going and I kept, I thought this, I'm, I have to just keep on going and it will just get better and, and I'll figure it out. And you know what? It just never happened. And after the three month part, I thought I'm still very unhappy doing this. I just, I'm not getting it and I don't know if I'll ever get it. Not right now. So I just quit. But it was one of the few times when I just thought, I'm going to quit because sometimes you can't master everything all the time. Sometimes you have to call it quits, especially if you're unhappy. Like I tried it over and over and over again, and I just was unhappy. Like I, and I was, it was kind of like, this is an unfulfilling experience. And so I stopped it. It's like if you don't like, um, certain types of food, you don't just keep on eating it, thinking that I will love this food at one point. I mean, maybe like coffee is one of those things that's an acquired taste, but sometimes you also have to try it and say, yeah, maybe not. It's okay. I'm still good. The sport is still good. Aikido is still good. It's just not for me. Or maybe I'll try it again and I'll love it right now. I don't really know. Well, that's the most loving thing is to be able to let go. Yeah. is to be able to and not um not to just try it once i think give it a fair shot yeah and whatever that means to you and then say either not for me or you know if my husband or wife wants to go in and take a class maybe i'll take it with them but i have no expectation of actually doing well in the class i'm just going to be with the experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that was so. your that was your experience with skating on a golf course but so you're going to do it again I'm going to do it classes. again. Um, I'll probably take a second lesson. Tomorrow is my guess. Uh, Jessica uh, loves it. So no matter what, I'll get some sort of skis. I'm just really wanting is, to try this. Was sport. Jessica back now? No, no. I, she tried it uh, this spring when she came out to visit and tried to, um, or found a place for us to rent. No, she's at Dr. Joe 
till Monday evening. In fact, she okay. told me she we had a brief phone call last night and she said they had a ropes course thing that they did on the beach yesterday morning. And you climb up on this top of something really high up and and then you, you jump off and there's like a parachute or something and everybody catches you. And and wow. so she went to do this thing and she jumped off backwards and leaped way into the air and landed and they caught her. And she goes, my only regret is I didn't try jumping even higher and further, but I expected that nobody realized that I was going to really go for it. Right. And I was going to be in a different place because I was going to jump so far than where they expected. Where right, just land in the sand. <laughs> Wow, that's fantastic. Wow, good for her. That's so, cool. So, so that, part of her healing process. Right. Okay, so um, so you're going to try it again. And then tell me about finishing second. What was that for? So yeah, the la last few stories here are um, years ago, I had this perfectionism tendency so much that oops, we've got Kitty going for the mice in the cage because uh, the mice is on the screen on the top of the cage. That's our last story. Um, hold on one second here. A uh, love bug calling love bug. Mouse is in the cage. We love mouse. I know you want mouse for dinner. Mouse is not yours for dinner. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that was a gentle toss of a tennis ball, not at love bug, but near love bug for a state change because there's a screen on the top of this thing. And the mouse is climbing like this, and she's like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. So, okay, with that said. Um, it's finishing second. Yes. So years ago, I had a big perfectionist tendency. I was getting back into cycling at a real high level, racing on the track. And um, I was offered a very strange opportunity by the, the team captain or coach or I don't know who you call it, the head of the team, which is, would you be the lead out man this year for one of our athletes who is trying to win the state championship Omnium, meaning accumulate the most points for the season. So your job will be to lead him out to the sprint at each race and in essence, let him pass you at the finish and you get it second mm -hmm. each time. Uh, he would have to work for it, of course. And I thought to myself, no pressure. I'll go for second place. He did win the state championship. It's interesting. I look back on it and I'm like, you were too f afraid to go for it and have it not work out to even go for it. So I have no regrets about it. Mm -hmm. But if I think back about it, it was my perfectionism tendency. I was trying to get myself off of the hook. Mm. by not even allowing myself to mm. try and win. Mm -hmm. It's like a sabotage. It is. Yeah, that's a yeah. good way to put it. I signed yeah. up for sabotage saying, well, I'm worried that maybe if I go for first and I don't get first, how will I feel? And so I completely didn't even allow myself that opportunity. Yep, I've done that before too. Yeah, interesting. So it's about the fear of making mistakes. You sabotage yourself. And actually, you make a mistake so that you don't have to, you know, face actually something that you don't, you, you feel like you're not going to win. So, yeah, interesting. Wow, that's interesting. It's, it's still got a little twist in my gut when I think about it, because I was writing. There's no regret. It's just such a powerful learning of how much we can be afraid of screwing up and not getting it right that we shoot ourselves in the foot and don't even give ourselves a chance. <laughs> so does this have to do with the mice? Because now you have like 50 mice in there. Those nine mice have populated it to 50 in there. It, 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 is, it is nine or 10 at the moment. And I was, I was talking with um, a coaching client yesterday and he gave me the clue and I figured out where I can release them, where there is some solid ground this time of year. And so my goal is tomorrow, and, and I've been you know waiting for the perfect day and the perfect time to release the mices. There is no perfect time. They're right. outdoor creatures. They don't belong in the house. They're going to drive the kitties mad. Right. Or me mad because I have to babysit the kitties <laughs> who are <laughs> looking at this mouse, this cat-proof cage, 
and going, really, Michael? Really, Daddy? <laughs> it's not as cat-proof as you think. We will figure it out for you. <laughs> <laughs> So tomorrow I will overcome that tendency to want it to be perfect for mousies and I will release them and then have a place where I can release more mousies because we catch them. We catch them in the garage and we don't want them eating all of our possessions in the garage. They don't, they don't come into the house because they know better. Well, how do you catch them? So you catch them in a cage, you have like a trap that's a little cage that they want A no-kill trap. In fact, we got, we got some plastic no-kill traps from, from Amazon one of them, oh my God, chopped off a mouse's tail. Um, so we are not using them as traps anymore. Um, instead, we have the plastic they, ones. Did that? That's fascinating. It had, a, it had a heavy door that would close behind the mouse. Oh, ouch! And one of the mousies was very. Um, is it a kappa? It wasn't fast enough. <laughs> a kappa. <laughs> it wasn't a pit or a vata. <laughs> no. Didn't have enough fire going on. <laughs> sorry, it's okay. Lost its and tail. So now I'm sorry, little mouse. We have a we have a stainless steel trap, and I've looked at him recently. He he's a he's a big dude, um, but he probably brings pow to everybody in there and helps yeah. ground everybody. Um, and I've resisted calling him stubby or or shorty or. <laughs> like, he's just calling Kaffa. I, I don't I don't have a, a name for them. You never name the animals or then you can't release them. I get that's, it. That's, that's the big challenge. Um, although one of them is Rocky, but uh, because he's the one who will actually stand up before me. <laughs> 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 but um, where, where was You're I? You're automating now processes. We stainless, now oh. we have a stainless steel. We have one, one trap that we had before. It's a stainless steel trap that doesn't have a door that closes on him. There's just one way in and you can't get out the same way. You have to squeeze your way through. Uh... And I have a trap in the garage with no bait in it right now. Because I really, I need to catch them to protect the garage, but I don't want to catch them. And they're still finding their way into the trap. I'm like, come on, there's Wait, nothing in here. But the trap is, so the, but the trap is set even, so they're in the trap, even though it's there's just, nothing in there. Well, Maybe yeah, they smell the food that was in there before. Did you have like peanut butter? Come up with, yeah, is that they've cleaned it, but there's still a scent. Yeah. But I need to put it down there because if not, they will eat everything that's in yeah, our garage. Yeah, no, I get it. And you're not okay. killing them. You're just replace, you know, relocating them. <laughs> relocation. It's a mouse relocation program, like a witness <laughs> protection program. Okay, yes. what's going on with um, your processes, or have you talked about them already? Um, well, haven't haven't really. Well, just about automating. So that's the last last thought. So I called it last week because I have a, a coaching client that I'm not sure if they're right now in 30 minutes. I'll deal okay. with that. Oh, okay. I said next year is the year 2019 of leverage and love. It's really leverage, systematize, and love. How <laughs> can I get the processes out of my hands that I don't need to do? Or as mm -hmm. Ajit, Ajit, Nawalka, Ajit Nawalka, who we had on, who is the former CEO and co-founder of Mind Valley, said, how can I never have to do this task again? Mm -hmm. And so I've been working to automate processes and write down all of the rules what are Michael's rules that he knows intuitively but hasn't put on paper so that I can hand these things off to somebody else? And, and that requires certainly in handing off a letting go of perfectionism and understand things will be very different potentially initially so that something greater can come. Yeah. If we hold on, if we become the control freaks that we're all capable of for survival, because that's what we're taught since little kids. If we hold on for dear life, then there's no room for us to grow and expand. Yep. So I have to write it down and then let, let in go. the end, let it evolve on Bingo. its own. Yeah. Excellent. Woohoo. Okay. Any last words? Do something each and every day that's uncomfortable or me. <laughs> I always want to say is guaranteed not to succeed. I had a guest on the show. Jessica was aghast by what this guest said. I don't remember which one it was, but he would always ask his children when they would come home, did you fail at something today? Mm -hmm. And he meant it as a positive. Yeah. What he was saying is, did you try something that you didn't think was going to succeed, but you went for it anyway? Mm -hmm. If we can all live life that way, we will find a much greater version of ourselves 
than we ever imagined. Woohoo on that. That's definitely true. So that's my challenge. Go out and fail at something today. And then tomorrow, fail at something again or fail in something in a whole new way. And you will find yourself not only growing the screw up muscle, but growing your confidence muscle greater than you can imagine. Yeah, it's, it's building the muscle of confidence. That's how you do it. Oh, man. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler and CJ Lou from the Fired Up a CJ Show saying, be well, have fun, let go of those mousies and screw up something today. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> On your way to your greatest success, put yourself out there. And above and beyond all else, shine bright. <laughs> it means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.